and welcome to According to Pete. Uh, this is going to post on the 29th of January, isn't it? Um, in honor of uh, our crystal anniversary, I'm going to talk about crystals today. What are they? How do they work? Uh, those things that you wear around your neck to make you feel all mellow and one with... No, 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 no. Maybe they do, but I don't, I, I don't wear one. Uh, electronically, we're talking about things like this. This is a tiny little... This is a 32... Uh, kilohertz crystal for an RTC. Uh, that's the symbol. We're entirely dependent on these things. They are the source of all of our clocks for all of our digital equipment and probably many more things. And they're filters too. And then, uh, I don't know, you hold them towards your heart chakra and it does a thing. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to talk about these things today and uh, give you a little, uh, a little bit of analysis as to what they look like over frequency little rough idea of how they work and at the very end I'm going to give you three questionable circuits to play with and you can throw some parts at it and see how they work and let's go. Let's start off with some uh, construction stuff and, and I apologize if this seems jumbled up uh, it's reflective of the chaos that's typically in my head so try to bear with me. Now construction wise you've all seen like cans that look like that they're about the size of your thumbnail or so um, inside the can, generally, uh, we've got a couple of posts, and you can find pictures of, of this all over the internet, so feel free to have a look. And then they've got a couple of electrodes and a little piece of schmutz right in the middle of there. Now, what is that schmutz? Well, in most cases, it's uh, quartz, silicon dioxide. Uh, in some cases, it's also uh, some ceramics that exhibit this. Now, the thing about the quartz, the silicon dioxide, what happens is uh, the, the secret sauce is all in the lattice, okay? And so what happens is the silicon dioxide, so I guess S, I, and O, and O, what it will do is it will bond into these uh, tetrahedron-like bits uh, with each other, and it will form a lattice that doesn't have inversion symmetry. No inversion symmetry, which I take to mean, and I read a few definitions, but I'm still a little fuzzy. If you flip it over upside down, it doesn't look like itself anymore. It, 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 it's a, you, you, can't, you can't flip it around a point and have the symmetry look exactly the same. And if you can achieve that, you get something called the piezoelectric effect. Now, don't start arguing with me about pronunciation of piezo or piezo, okay? I, uh, people say it all over the map. Um, but... The thing about the piezo effect, what it is, is um, if you have a piece of quartz or uh, a piece of this uh, ceramic that, that exhibits the same function, if you compress the material, it creates an electric field, okay? That's wicked cool. And if you release it, it will return that electric field back to its surrounding environment. This is the sort of thing that gives you uh, barbecue igniters and things that you zap your friends and your kids with. Um, and what those do, there's like, the, you know, you, you've probably ripped one out of a lighter before, right? It's got like a spring in it, and the spring's got a hammer, and it hits the quartz, and it goes out through this wire, and you go, ow, and that's what happens. Um, so that's, that's that particular aspect. Now, the reverse of that is also true. If you apply an electric field to it, which is what's happening up here, right? You've got the electrodes on either side of a piece of quartz. If you apply an electric field to it, it will distort the shape of the quartz. And so uh, if you release that electric field, it will dump the energy back out, okay? That's what gives us oscillators and filters and stuff like that. Okay, now if you look at a crystal, uh, its impedance over frequency, what you get is a plot that looks something like this. Now if you can pick out the colors, I don't know if you can, but this is purple and it represents magnitude of the impedance. The green represents phase, okay? Middle is zero, down here is minus 90, up here is plus 90. And you can find this plot on the internet if you go look at it. Now, what happens is, as you sweep the frequency up across the crystal, at a certain frequency, its impedance will go, I mean, it, uh, its phase Remember this, phase is, is, is at minus 90. Now, remember that minus 90 degrees phase is capacitive. Remember that from school? If you went to school, maybe you didn't go to school. Um, but it's capacitive. And at a certain frequency, the impedance will go to minimum. In fact, what it will do, it will, it will go to the real component of the resistance in the crystal, okay? Which we'll talk about the model in a sec, just a little bit. 
Um, and this frequency represents the series resonance, okay? Because a series, uh, you remember like a, a series LC circuit, um, when it is resonating, it, it goes to minimum impedance, okay? Now, as frequency increases, oh, and at this point, the phase is actually zero. And from that point, it goes up to around plus 90. Now it's inductive, okay? And it's inductive all the way up to where it gets to this point, which is parallel res uh, resonance. <laughs> parallel resistance. Parallel resonance, where the magnitude of the impedance is maximized. And again, at this frequency, we've got our phase at zero. And then as frequency increases, the phase continues on as um, capacitive. So it's minus 90 again. Now, it's worth mentioning that further on up the road here, you can get uh, parasitic resonances that shouldn't be there. Ultimately, you will get overtones. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but you can see like little spurious notches here. And in fact, I'll show you the circuit that uh, I use to get this because I don't have an impedance analyzer and so I used a really janky circuit and kind of extrapolated some things. We'll, we'll talk about that. Now, between uh, res uh, uh, parallel uh, resonance and, or <laughs> parallel resonance and series resonance, uh, it's acting inductive. And so there's an electrical model for this region specifically. Um, now as a tip off, many times what you find uh, is that uh, any crystal that you buy from any given vendor will have a load capacitance associated with it that you need to look at. Now, what's going on there is that they are tuning effectively this model to resonate in the inductive region, okay? So the model largely reflects an inductor. And what we're, what we're looking at here, this guy, is um, the stray capacitance that comes from the electrodes and the can and all the stuff that you find your crystal in. Uh, then you have your inductor proper. You have the uh, DC or the, the series, re uh, series resistance of your imaginary winds. And then you have like the capacitance that is supposed to be modeling the capacitance between the winds or something like that. So kind of look at it like that. Now, the ability to tune this circuit anywhere in this region is called pullability, okay? And that's, that's another stated thing in data sheets a lot of times. Now I will tell you, uh, as I went into my testing and fooling around with this thing, um, I didn't have any data sheets. I didn't, I, I, used, I used two crystals. I used a 32.768, right, an RTC crystal, and I used a four megahertz crystal that was previously used as a filter crystal. I have a bag of these things at home and I just wanted to see if I could make it work. Turns out I did, and really well. But that's beside the point. Um, so this is the electrical model and you tune it in here. Now it'll also, it's implied, but without any, um, any shunt capacitance, any load capacitance, you're gonna get this guy right there. Okay, so a little bit more information about the physical makeup of a crystal and, and the electrical model. Now. With your typical LC circuit, your tank circuit, um, you're you're setting resonance values, uh, and you're you know you're, you're you're making the curve by virtue of you know these actual components. Well, there aren't any actual components here that we're dealing with. So instead of dealing with these for tuning, a crystal is entirely dependent upon uh, its physical size, right? Its size, its shape, and the cut of the crystal. Okay. Those are the things that play into how it works. Now, I will also tell you that um, I mentioned earlier that they can work at overtones. Turns out, right, it turns out that crystals working at their fundamental frequency are really only good to about 30-ish megahertz, okay? At that point, the, the material starts to get too small and too fragile and it breaks. And, and in fact, it's worth us to also saying that these things can age. They can corrode, the contacts can corrode internally, the crystal can crack, um, various other things that can degrade performance of these things. Um, but you need to know that the frequency of operation is dependent upon the size, the shape, and the cut of the crystal. Um, and in fact, crystals that are operating at their fundamental 
the supporting circuitry is relatively more simple than if you're trying to operate at an overtone or a higher frequency than 30 megahertz. And in fact, in that configuration, you can really only get up to around 300-ish megahertz. And after that, you gotta go to something called a PLL, a phase lock loop. And we are totally not talking about phase lock loops today, but it is on the agenda for some time in the next year, I think. So I'll stop talking about that. So also, also, I'm sorry if this is all jumbled up. It's all, I, I got like totally keyed up on crystals and how they work and it's like, oh dude, I gotta tell you everything. So it's all coming out like a mess. But um, a little note on Q and bandwidth. Crystals are really, really high Q, okay? So like for any other given tuned LC circuit, you might get lucky to get Q in the tens or something, you know, uh, depending on how well you wound your inductor around a roll of toilet paper. But um, for the case of a crystal, they can be very, very high. Uh, in fact, they can very typically run tens of thousands up to millions in some case. Very high. They retain a lot of energy. Now, Q also represents bandwidth. Now, in my example, uh, one of the crystals I was playing with, that four megahertz uh, one that I found in a bag somewhere in my basement, um, when I tested this circuit, the difference between uh, res series resonance and parallel resonance is about 600 hertz. So very, very narrow, okay? And if you remember Q, I think my marker's going bad, equals F over BW. So um, this would be four megahertz over 400 hertz equals really high. So for that reason, um, and I've been talking about like, oh, you can tune it all through here. Um, and for an oscillator, this is what you would do. You would give it a shunt capacitance and you would tune it to some place very specifically. Now for something like a crystal filter, it's different. Um, now we'll tell you right up front, I did not do any research into crystal filters, but looking at a circuit, I can kind of surmise what's going on. So let me back up over here. So for a crystal filter, what you will get is you get your crystal here, and then they paint the ground, and you might get another one there. And all right, so, so they're trying to pass signal from one element to the next in series. Now when you do that, you want minimum impedance, which happens right there. So without doing any real research, what I'm, what I'm envisioning on a crystal filter is that you're gonna wanna run it at series resonance. You want the impedance to be the minimum as you're passing signal through the filter. Otherwise, it's going to attenuate more. And they do anyway, right? This doesn't go to zero ohms, but it goes to something low. Um, I would also imagine that you want the phase at the frequency of interest to be zero, so that you know you're passing like sidebands or something. Um, you don't want them interfering with each other. So, without doing any research, that's what I think is happening in terms of a filter. Now, let me reiterate the bandwidth uh, for the filter. Right now, you de you define the bandwidth as like, you know, the 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 three dB down point of, of your passband, and that's what you call your bandwidth, right? So in the case of this guy, I would imagine that once you're about 3 dB up from the minimum value of impedance, that's your acceptable bandwidth on this plot. And because the Q is so high, real narrow skirts, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and so they make really great filters. Now in the case where I was using these four megahertz uh, crystals as filters, it was for a shortwave uh, radio receiver. And it turned out uh, that they were so narrow that I couldn't use any because it was just attenuating everything out and I, I ultimately had to pick them out. Uh, and somehow I've got a bag of them, whatever. Fun time! Let's talk about some circuits. Now, um, I showed you that plot of the impedance over frequency, right? And like I said before, you can find that in a number of places on the internet. But that's not fun. I want to see it for myself. 
And so what I did was I set up this particular circuit with um, a couple of different crystals, right? The, the two that I mentioned, the, the, the RTC crystal and the four megahertz crystal. And so I just set up a voltage divider with the idea that when I hit resonance, I'm going to see some action between these and I'm going to see greater and lesser magnitude of signal here. And I don't have an impedance analyzer, but what I do have is my uh, analog discovery USB scope, which has this really cool function uh, where you can do some network analysis. Uh, sort of, kind of. Um, and so what you do is you put signal in at the top and you might have to vary this resistor. I found 100K works pretty well, allows me to see uh, exactly what I'm uh, looking at, sort of, kind of. Uh, crystal at the bottom to ground and then you read at this point. Now, let me tell you, this totally does not work. Except it kind of does. Okay, so what happens is, and I'll, I'll show you this, is it's going along, and then when you start to get to resonance, it'll start doing this stuff, and, like, and then it'll go back, right? So you don't, you don't at all get the nice thing like that. Um, at least, certainly not at the, uh, the 32 kilohertz. At the four megahertz, I got a much better response. What I found was happening, right, and maybe I should have figured this out, and maybe you can see what's happening, but remember, high Q, the analog discovery, when it samples, what it's doing is, uh, over time, it will run its signal, and then it will stop, and then it will run another signal that's a higher frequency, and then it will stop, and it will cycle through these for as many samples as you're doing. Now, because this is high Q, when these signals start to get to resonance, what you start to see is some more schmutz down in the quiet area. What's that? That's the crystal resonating. And if you look at this on a scope, right, this, this is the first obvious thing you see, like, huh, what's going on there? And then as it gets closer and closer to uh, the resonance region, what you can see is these signals interfering with each other and actually you see, uh, you start to see an envelope, right? So there's actually a beat frequency going on. And so it's all <laughs> interfering with itself. Now, the 32 kilohertz one didn't work so well. The four megahertz worked better, right? So it's not, it's not quite as clean as that. There's still some schmutz in there, but you can still, you can make out where the peaks are. And you know my probe and, and, and my values that I've chosen may be affecting some of those magnitude readings as well. But it's less about the actual magnitude of the signal or the impedance and more about I want to see the characteristic. And so this is one way that you can do it. Now you can also do it independently if you just have like a signal generator and a scope and you want to plot it on Excel or something like that. Uh, you can do it the same way. That will not give you a phase plot. It'll get more complicated from there. But as a basic fool around thing, if you've got a spare crystal in your basement and you've got some way to do this, this is a fun experiment. Now this is my first oscillator circuit that I tried to make. Now, bear in mind, I'm not an oscillator expert, uh, certainly not with crystals or anything else really. Um, and so I have found several schematics online that are roughly what I'm looking for that look like they function, and I have adapted them to fit components that I have on hand. And I wanted to see what I could make work and just how hard it is. So, this one, based around an LM358. Now, because the LM358 is not a high bandwidth part, I tried this one for the RTC crystal, so 32.768 kilohertz. Um, voltage divider, 100K, 100K. Oh, that guy. I need to know what that guy is. That guy is 100 picofarad. 100 picofarad. Okay, so if you set this guy up, and this is pin one here and pin two here and pin three here of the LM358. Um, I've got 100K in the feedback to the uh, negative going input and the crystal itself to the positive input, uh, and both of these uh, are coming from the output. Now there isn't any load capacitance on this guy, right? There's specified to be 
like 15 picofarad or something, uh, seven, I can't remember. Um, but I don't have any. Yet, this is oscillating. And it's oscillating pretty close. Uh, I think what I measured was 32.761, okay? Now it could be that it is uh, actually, this, this is tuning it a little bit. Um, I can't remember as I was fooling with this if I had much luck tuning this sucker. It wanted to stick pretty close to where it was. But like I say, these aren't optimized for anything. This is just to see how hard it is to get an oscillation out of it. So I would encourage you to give this guy a try. 100 Ks, 100 picofarad, another 100 K, and 100 microfarad uh, on there. You can strip one of these things out of any number of things. That, they're around, they really are. Uh, and an LM358, and it's that easy. And what is, the output wasn't the greatest output, but it's oscillating. Um, what it's actually doing, it's almost a triangle wave, so it definitely needs some tuning or some tweaking, except it's actually railing on the top. So I probably got to adjust my reference here. Didn't do a whole lot of analysis. I just got some oscillation, right? And you can too, so go get some oscillation. All right, I got one more, not based on an op amp. I'll show it to you in a sec. Okay, last circuit. This one's based around a 3904 and it runs my four megahertz filter crystal. It works, how about it? Um, now again, this is not optimized for anything. I started out with a basic circuit and I adjusted it until uh, it complied with values that I had on hand. And it actually, this works the best of anything. Um, so 3904, you've got uh, 1K from emitter to ground. You've got your feedback network uh, here, and this is uh, splitting uh, by the ratio of the two. I don't totally know how the circuit works. I can surmise some of it, but like I said, I did this in a hurry. I copied the circuit and then I poked around with values. And that's effectively what I'm recommending to you. Yeah, you can go do all the circuit analysis and stuff, and yeah, you'll learn some stuff, but really, it's a lot more fun to get your hands in it and poke around with the values and see what happens. And that's what I did. So, you got the four megahertz crystal on the base to ground, and just lost my cap and uh, 100 picofarad, one nanofarad, so that's a 101, that's a 102, and then 200K from the base up to the collector, which is actually two 100K resistors, right? Remember the last circuit? I scavenged those parts. Uh, 3904, pretty standard. Now this guy, that's the key component. I would not have imagined that was such a key component. So there's clearly something else going on in the circuit that I'm not aware of. I thought this was a decoupling cap. Um, and it's probably acting in that capacity to a degree, but it's also very much about uh, shaping the waveform. And so it bears more analysis on my part before I can say anything meaningful about it. But this circuit, once I finish tweaking it, looks amazing. It's making a great sine wave. It's about one volt peak to peak, and it, it, it's on my old Tektronix scope. I mean, okay, the scope is showing a nice sine wave, which I believe. I believe the shape. I don't know if I believe the frequency entirely, because this thing hasn't been calibrated in at least 18 years or so, so who knows. But it's saying that it's running at like 3.99996 megahertz. So really close, and the sine wave is beautiful. Now, you may not have a four megahertz crystal on hand, but you might have something else. So when you're fooling with circuits like this, I will tell you that, um, well, hmm, I was about to say load capacitance, and this, this, this is kind of a, a semi-universal. Most times load capacitance for most crystals is in like the tens of picofarads range. So I expect this to be acting more in the tuning for that reason, because, because it's in that order of magnitude. This one, I'm not clear on that yet. Um, but a little more poking around, a little more reading, uh, a little more reading of people who like the sound of their own writing on the internet, and I'll learn some things. Um, I definitely recommend putting this one together. These are all parts that you probably have on hand, and you can probably scavenge something out of an old piece of gear that you have in your basement 
just like I do. Check out that waveform, man. That, I, I could not have hoped for a better result out of that thing. Um, 3.99897 uh, Tektronix scope. Very old Tektronix scope. Thank you for hanging out today and talking about crystals. In fact, thank you for hanging with SparkFun for the last 15 years, if you've been a customer for that long. Uh, it's been a long haul, it's been a lot of fun, and I uh, hope to do it long into the future. Um, but more specifically, thank you for watching According to Pete today. Uh, next time, I don't know what's next time. I guess I'll have to check the schedule. But uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them uh, in the spot below. And uh, yeah, if you have any ideas for videos, put them up too. And we'll see if we can make something. All right, see you next time. Bye.